Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. This is the busiest time of year for online dating sites. Match.com has been around for two decades now, and it's common for people to turn online to look for love. I don't even know if my dad knows that we met online because <laughs> I was, she was so, so embarrassed. But to me, it wasn't as big a deal. With more people meeting online, how is this changing society? Plus, we'll remember legendary ballerina Violette Verdi. She was a principal ballerina in the New York City Ballet for 20 years before teaching at the IU Jacobs School of Music. The kids would look to her with such reverence, such um, appreciation, right, that this seminal figure in this field uh, was in their midst. And we'll visit the Indiana sock manufacturer that is a licensee of the NFL. They've spent the past week making socks to commemorate Super Bowl 50. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Well, it's been a busy week throughout the state. Barbara Brozier is here to break down this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. A refugee relocation group wants to block Governor Pence's order barring state agencies from participating in the resettlement of Syrian refugees. A federal judge heard arguments in the case today. Exodus Refugee Immigration is requesting a temporary injunction blocking Pence's order until its lawsuit is resolved. The American Civil Liberties Union of Indiana sued the governor in November on behalf of the group. Representative Todd Young's candidacy for Senate is in jeopardy. Candidates must submit 500 signatures from registered voters in each congressional district. Young submitted more than 650 in the first congressional district, but the county clerk validated 501 of them and counts by state house media found only 497. The election commission could rule on the future of Young's candidacy next week. Some lawmakers say it might be time to re-examine the signature requirement. The state has released its newly revised forestry plan. It doesn't include any significant changes to the amount of logging in state forests, but does include plans to make forests more accessible to Hoosiers looking to pitch a tent or explore a cave. Other than logging, DNR officials say one of the most popular requests they received during the public comment period was for more recreational opportunities in forests. Former GOP chairman Eric Holcomb is running with Governor Mike Pence in the 2016 election. I hope you can tell by my sunny disposition, despite the weather outside, uh, how proud and eager I am to get to work. Uh, the, the lieutenant governor's area of responsibility aligns perfectly with my interests. Holcomb could take the position earlier if current Lieutenant Governor Sue Alsperman resigns before the election. Alsperman is applying for the Ivy Tech Community College presidency. Holcomb was running for U.S. Senate but dropped out of the race Monday. A Southern Indiana man is appealing his murder conviction. Samuel Salee was sentenced to life without parole for the 2013 killings of four people in Waynesville. The Indiana State Supreme Court heard arguments yesterday. Salee's attorney, Jane Ann Noblet, argued the evidence against her client was circumstantial and that the conviction should be overturned. Your Honor, I'm not asking for a new ruling of law. I'm asking that under the existing law, that you find that, that the jury could not have found he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The state argued there is sufficient evidence to convict Saley of the murders, incited a confession and physical evidence. 
A psychiatrist will examine the former IU student accused of attacking a Muslim woman at a Bloomington cafe. A judge previously granted Tristan Bickford's motion to seek a change of venue due to the publicity of the trial. Bickford faces charges of battery against a public safety officer, strangulation, intimidation, battery resulting in bodily harm, and battery by bodily waste. Health officials say an Indiana woman who has the Zika virus recently returned from Haiti. Officials aren't releasing her name, but they say she suffered a mild illness that did not require hospitalization and has since made a full recovery. The woman is not pregnant. The State Department of Health says there is very little ri risk of an outbreak in Indiana. And if we uncovered evidence that local transmission of Zika virus might be occurring, uh, we would be able to ramp up our control efforts very quickly because we're already doing very similar activities for West Nile virus. The CDC has now reported 35 cases of Zika virus in the U.S. None fatal in all of the cases are travel related. Indiana University is working with state and county health officials after confirming two cases of mumps on the Bloomington campus. IU requires students to receive the MMR vaccine for measles, mumps, and rubella. Both students who contracted the virus had been vaccinated. But health officials say the vaccine is only 80 to 90 percent effective. A stay is temporarily halting the EPA's clean power plan. Many states, including in Indiana, challenged the plan, claiming it was an act of executive overreach. It would have required Indiana to create a plan to reduce its carbon emissions by more than a third over 15 years. The stay is in effect until the regulations are argued in the U.S. Court of Appeals in June. Former Indiana Governor Edgar Whitcomb was honored today with a funeral procession through downtown Indianapolis. An honor guard paid tribute to the late governor yesterday with a presentation at the State House. Whitcomb died last week at the age of 98. Well, before becoming president, Abraham Lincoln spent time splitting wood to build fences. The mallet he used is now on display at the Indiana State Museum. Governor Mike Pence and museum officials unveiled the artifact this week at a ceremony in Indianapolis. Harrison Wagner reports. A little longer than four score and seven years ago, a young Abraham Lincoln and his family crossed the Ohio River from Kentucky into Indiana. On Tuesday, the Indiana State Museum unveiled an artifact from that period of President Lincoln's life. As a politician, Lincoln's humble roots and hard work on the frontier endeared him to voters who gave him the nickname the Rail Splitter after the image of young Lincoln splitting logs to make fence rails. Now, the very mallet Lincoln would have used to split those logs has been loaned to the Indiana State Museum by the Carter family, who were neighbors of the Lincolns. 2016 is an important year for this display, and not just because of the state's bicentennial. We're also celebrating the bicentennial of the arrival of a family from Kentucky that brought with them a boy who would transform the nation. President and CEO of the Indiana State Museum Tom King and Governor Mike Pence were among those at the unveiling ceremony. Now, one of my predecessors, Otis Bowen, said it well. He said, Lincoln made Illinois, but Indiana made Lincoln. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Harrison Wagner. The Carter family lent the mallet to the state for a year as a way to celebrate Indiana's bicentennial. And Joe, today is actually Lincoln's birthday. Oh. He'd be 207 years old. Wow, thanks a lot, Barbara. Well, she dedicated her life to dance and teaching others how to perfect the art. Ballet legend Violette Verdi died this week in Bloomington at the age of 82. As Sarah Whitmire reports, Verdi had a long, successful career on the stage before coming to Indiana University to teach. Costumes, honors, and photos filled Violette Verdi's Bloomington home. Yeah, you see, that's it. It's a, when Eddie was lifting me. Violette Verdi was born in 1933 in a small town in northwest France. Her father died when she was young, and she was raised by a strict mother. Because she was such an energetic child, her mother asked a doctor what she could do to tire out her daughter. He said, OK, we have to make her dance. And that is how Verdi got her start in ballet. She was six. Fast forward to 1945. Verdi performed for the first time with Roland Petit's ballets in France. She quickly gained an international reputation. In 1953, she would come to the States for her first U.S. tour, using the stage name Violette Verdi. She would go on to perform in more than 100 ballets and with more than 50 companies, including the Paris Opera and the Metropolitan Opera. 
A favorite of legendary choreographer George Balanchine, she was a principal dancer for the New York City Ballet for two decades. She stopped performing in 1977 to become the first female artistic director of the Paris Opera Ballet. After a long career as a performer and a choreographer, she joined the ballet faculty at Indiana University's Jacobs School of Music in 1996. The kids would look to her with such reverence, such um, appreciation, right, that this seminal figure in this field uh, was in their midst and that they just had a chance to have be taught by her. They, it's not somebody that was um, a historic figure in their lives. It was a real, honest-to-gosh figure who, who choreographed for her, and she was the muse for Balanchine, and they then had a direct line to someone like Balanchine. One, two, three, four. Good. Open the knee over five toes, because otherwise you, you roll a little bit. <laughs> There's a distinction of behavior. Our dancers won't go like this. Ah, oh, shit, you know, the, they don't do that. They said, oh my God, you know, it's really hard to do. I'm a little bit tired, but I think I'll be okay. I mean, she was always able to dance. I mean, there was never any, any physical, physical challenge that she had to overcome, even in, later in life. So she was able to do everything that she needed to do to demonstrate for the students, right? So, so she was completely capable of doing anything and communicating it to them through dance, right? She didn't have to use words as much as model it on the dance floor. During her 20 years at IU, numerous other universities would come calling. Verdi guest lectured around the world, but always returned to Bloomington. Richard says Verdi liked that IU was a public university, and she had the ability to be influential among all parts of society. And that combination of the artistic in and scholarly environment is completely unique, right? Most of Europe separates it into into conservatories and performance stands alone. But she, that would never be the right place for her. She was too curious a person, right? She would learn from everybody. She, was, she wouldn't want to be segregated artistically, right? She'd want to be in a scholarly home. Verdi continued to teach at IU until she unexpectedly fell ill late last month. Verdi divorced when she was young, and she never remarried. She didn't have any children of her own, but she leaves behind a lasting impact. I have so many children. <laughs> so many dancing children. <laughs> For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sarah Whitmire. In 2013, Verdi was awarded the IU President's Medal for Excellence. That's the highest honor an IU president can bestow. In presenting it, Michael McRobbie called Verdi an Indiana University treasure. The Jacobs School is finalizing details for a, cer for a ceremony to honor Verdi's memory. And I'm joining us now is Duane Busick, and you've worked, you taped uh, Miss, uh, Miss uh, Violette Verdi many times, right? And that's how you got to know her. Yeah, I've actually met Violette when she first came to IU in 1996 uh, to work at the ballet department. And, and uh, uh, she is such an unassuming uh, but in incredible person that uh, uh, she would have me over when she was needed to uh, uh, make a, a tribute to, to a, uh, a colleague who was retiring or, or uh, um, any special occasion that she uh, they wanted her to attend to, but her travel schedule wouldn't allow it. Um, so, an uh, interesting thing is, whenever I was uh, would travel, I I would, would see Violette in airports, and you know, whether it's <laughs> Detroit Airport, the San Francisco Airport, and I'd hear her go, "Oh, hello, my darling Duane," <laughs> and, and it was just always wonderful to see her because she was always traveling and and trying to give back to the people that that she had worked with. Well, and I think that's what you can take away most from her, from, from, from what I've been hearing, is that she was such a, a, a huge presence, a big deal, but yet she was so approachable. Yeah, I, I, one of the things that I noticed when looking around her house was a picture of Vivian Lee and her together, and, and, and Violette goes, yes, she was at my wedding, and, and uh, um, uh, you know, Violette married a, a man who had worked with Laurence Olivier, and, mm. and, and uh, Vivian Lee was, was uh, married to Laurence Olivier just before the, uh, her wedding. 
and then there was a signed print from Andy Warhol that was dedicated to, to Violette and her husband that, that uh, she kept in a closet. <laughs> she didn't even keep it displayed. It mm. was just, it was kept in a closet. And uh, uh, so it's just so unassuming and, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and just a delight to be around. And we'll be greatly missed. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, time that you had with her. Appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Online dating is finding more and more users. Around 25,000 people sign up every day. We'll look at what effects technology has on how and who we date. And while many were celebrating the Broncos win at the Super Bowl, one Indiana company was just gearing up for the work ahead. We'll visit a sock manufacturer that produces socks for the Super Bowl champs. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. I can change the world with my own two hands. Make it a better place with my own two hands. I'm going to make it a brighter place. With my own two hands, I'm going to help the human race. With my own two hands, I can hold you. In my own two hands, and I can comfort you. With my own two hands. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. More than 100 million people watched the Super Bowl last weekend, and as the seconds ticked away, the Broncos and their fans began to celebrate. But as J.D. Gray reports, when workers at one Martinsville company saw the Broncos' commanding lead, they knew it was time to get to work. As the final seconds ticked off the clock in the Super Bowl, the crew at FBF Originals and Martinsville knew who would win, and so they got to work. So they were there Sunday night, and literally watching the game as it unfolded yeah. and ready to, to run the machines. FBF Originals is a sock manufacturer. They are a licensee for the NFL, so that means they make the championship socks for fans and collectors. When they finally win, you hurry up and put the team on the machines, and this year it was the Broncos, so they are full of navy and orange. Boss says that the company produces millions of socks each year, not just for NFL teams, but for other sports and events as well. But this week, the focus is all Super Bowl 50 in Broncos colors. For Indiana News Desk, I'm J.D. Gray. FBF originals say that since Sunday, they've shipped thousands of pairs of Broncos socks across the country. Well, if you're looking for love this Valentine's Day, you might want to join millions of others and take to the Internet. As Lindsay Wright reports, online dating's popularity has skyrocketed and that just might have certain social implications. Annie Cool and her husband Kevin are scrolling through old pictures of themselves on their phones. The couple has been married for about two and a half years now, but began their relationship five years ago. They met on Match.com an online dating site that launched 20 years ago and has exploded in recent years. When we first met our families, she was... I don't even know if my dad knows that we met online <laughs> because was, I was, she was so, so embarrassed. But to me, it wasn't as big a deal, I mean... Annie and Kevin are far from alone. Match currently registers nearly 3 million users in North America, with around 25,000 people signing up each day. According to Pew Research, one in five adults between 25 and 34 years old have tried online dating, making the Internet as a whole the most common way for Americans to find a romantic partner. For millions of years, people turned to their surroundings, to their friends and their family, uh, who was in their social networks, who was in their tribe. And now we can go to the Internet and reach out across our community, across our town, across our state, across the country, across the world to find people with similar interests. And because online dating has become so popular, that negative stigma Annie was embarrassed about years ago is pretty much gone. It's the idea that we turn to technology and the internet to find relationships, whether it be sexual or romantic, 
um, this has become a normalized part of the, uh, how uh, people find each other today. On sites like Match.com, there's a basic list of questions you answer like, what's your age? How tall are you? What's your hair color? What's your body type? In the essay portion, you talk about what you do for a living, what your religion is, what are your favorite things. Then you're prompted to upload a photo. Although online dating allows people to screen potential partners based on a number of specific qualities, research actually shows that people are dating in a more diverse way than ever before. Is the proof is in the pudding, and we could say, what are the relationships in America today? Uh, what do they look like? Uh, who are these? Who are people pairing off with? And if we do that, we find that there's a rising number of people who are in biracial or multiracial relationships, who are uh, dating across uh, religious groups, who are uh, marrying across economic groups. But what does that mean for our society's future when around 23 percent of serious relationships and marriages result from online dating? Garcia says the answer can't be determined just yet. Whether turning to the internet and the web is changing our relationships, it, it must be. We know it is. Um, is it for better or worse? I think it's both. It's, uh, there's a lot of great things that come from it. There's a lot of new, complicated and new uh, uh, things to figure out that come with it. Um, but that's dating and that's, in, that's relationships, that's courtship. That's something that has been part of the human legacy for millions of years. Garcia adds that the dating sites simply break down barriers for meeting people. It's important to take the time to really get to know someone. And for Annie and Kevin, Match.com helped them do just that. What it really did for me, I thought, was just break the ice to where you could have a conversation beyond just looking at the profile. Just say, okay, this is somebody you can think, well, it might be something you like to, to talk to them further. After the first date, I definitely knew that this was someone that I could see myself with and ended up being for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and joining us now is Lindsay Wright, uh, who just reported on that story. Very interesting. We just heard from Justin Garcia saying people are crossing demographics more than ever. Why is that? Because you would think maybe that they would be the exact opposite. Yeah, that's right. They kind of seem to contradict themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that really surprised me. And what he's saying is this, this shift in patterns and traditions in dating isn't necessarily caused by online dating, but the internet. The internet is a huge player in this shift of what's important to us when we're dating. And um, the internet has opened up a huge world for learning new things and seeing new things. He used the example of you might meet someone online who would be otherwise outside of your social network who's a different race than you are. And then you realize, well, we like the same foods. We, we like to go to the same places. We like the same movies. Um, and so really what the Internet has done is just opened up this world for exploration, exploration sure. and that has translated into how we date. Now, what do all these findings mean, though, on an economic sense? Right. Well, we're, we're not sure because it is complicated. But I'll tell you something interesting. Um, so people are dating in a really diverse way um, in crossing economic groups. But there's one exception to that, and that is the very wealthy. And when I say very wealthy, we're talking about millionaires. The very wealthy are continuing to pair off with the very wealthy. And um, this is what Justin Garcia had to say about that. So that the money, if you take two wealthy people, rather than distributing it by imagining marry someone with less income, and then you bring that person up into a high income bracket, you just maintain what was two people are now in one high income household. And one more kind of sweet thing, yeah. Joe, is Match is estimating that one million Match made babies have been a result of relationships from the site. Interesting. Lindsay, thank you very much for being here today. And according to the Pew Research Center, 5% of Americans who are married or in a committed relationship say they met their significant other online. That includes a Bedford couple who's now been married for a decade. But as Barbara Brozier reports, it wasn't a dating website that brought them together. It was a chance meeting over a game of strategy. We met uh, playing backgammon uh, on Yahoo. So we were just I guess you invited me to play a game I, with you for... I saw somebody out there by the name of Ellie Brown, <laughs> and uh, so I said, oh, okay. And you don't know whether it's a male or female, but anyway, I just invited Ellie Brown to play a game of backgammon with me. That was back in 1999, long before millions of people turned to the internet to find love. Julie and John Ortles weren't even looking for it. We met at a time when we both had something in common. We were both going through a divorce. 
They kept playing games and started chatting over the phone before eventually meeting each other in person in Julie's native country of Canada. I was getting to the room and John came out of the elevator and I knew, knew like I knew it was him. And I looked at him, my heart started to beat and I think I fell in love right away. They covered a lot of miles after that, taking turns driving 16 hours one way to visit each other. Then on the one year anniversary of their first in-person encounter. Our hotel room overlooked the St. Mary's River and that's where they had the fireworks for Canada Day. And so anyway, we <laughs> <laughs> you get so emotion. Then <laughs> you propose. So I said yes. It's been more than a decade since then, and John and Julie are just as happy in person as they are in all of those old photos. They may not play backgammon much anymore, but they've learned how to win at love. Lots of love, uh, lots of humor. I think we need to laugh. John makes me laugh like crazy, so. And, and lots of mutual respect. Yes, yes. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. How neat. That's the end of our program, but our work continues online at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.